Dude. I don't know what it is, but I feel it. This is the real <laughs> disruption. So, uh, you know, I, so let me introduce kind of what we're going on. We've been doing these weekly webinars every single week and, and just kind of talking about market color and what we see going on in the market, where we've come from, where we are, and where we think we're going. And that's really been the purpose of these webinars. And, um, you know, today I really wanted to, to bring somebody on that's a really good friend of mine and I think can really explain what's going on in real estate. Um, and reason being is I'm going to let him kind of give a little bit of color on himself. But Jason is somebody I met um, about 11 years ago at this point, who is one of the top realtors in the country. Um, you know, and, and, and I can comfortably say that he's one of the top realtors. He's named Realtor of the Decade for Arizona. Um, and he now started a franchise, and I think he's in about 17 or 18 markets now. And I'll let him kind of give specifics on that. But the reason why I think this story is very relevant to what's going on today is because Jason was a pretty good realtor before the 2008 crash. Um, and he basically was in a market that was one of the most effective markets in the whole entire country and he lost everything. And I met him that way. I met him after he had just kind of lost everything. He was restarting himself and he's now built himself back up to what you see today. So I think it's relevant to see somebody come through a recession or a crash or, um, and come to this. So, um, Jason, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Ralph. I appreciate it, man. It's, uh, yeah, we've been connected a lot the past uh, six months or so, so it's been awesome to reconnect and um, and be a part of what you're doing. It's amazing. Yeah, and, you know, again, thank you for doing this. And, and you know, I, I mentioned some stuff um, about you and when I met you, and I kind of wanted to start there. I wanted to start, you know, how you restarted your business in, in 09, 2010, uh, and where it's kind of come from there. Just explain to people who you are. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, today I run... Um, one of the, uh, I guess you'd call it larger teams in the country in terms of volume. Uh, it's called the Jason Mitchell Group, really fancy name. And, um, but, uh, you know, we have uh, created this niche and carved out this niche to where we've become the trusted real estate referral partner for a lot of large organizations such as, you know, Quicken Loans, New American Funding, Zillow, Veterans United. I mean, a lot of big companies trust us with their clients. And so we, we kind of fall into this niche over the past five years or so uh, to be the trusted real estate referral group. And now we've become the number one real estate referral group in the country. Um, we don't have a ton of agents. We have about 120 agents across 14 states right now. Um, but with those 120 agents, we're set to do about 1.1 billion this year in volume, even with everything going on. Um, so we, we, we've carved out and made a name for ourselves. As far as my personal career goes, I got back into residential real estate in 2010. Um, and really it was just me um, grinding. And I mean grinding, grinding, and um, you know, basically selling anything I could sell because I, I had to eat. Um, I went through a bankruptcy in 2009, lost everything I had. Um, and I was doing very well too, like a lot of folks. I started my career uh, at a company called Pulte Homes. I was a sales consultant for them and did very, very well at Pulte, came out here to Arizona with Pulte, then I went on my own, had a couple year great run there, and then the crash hit, I was in the financing at the time when the crash hit, so when I met you, and then really in 2010, as the market slowly started to turn, I wanted to get back to my passion, which was real estate, and then, you know, from 2010 to about 2013, I was building, building, um, just doing more and more numbers for myself, um, and then, you know, it just started to snowball. I, I, I created a name for myself here in Arizona. In 2015, I became the number one agent in the state, 16, 17, 18. And, um, you know, last this December, this past December, uh, they announced I was actually voted real estate agent of the decade for Arizona. And so uh, it's been a great ride and a uh, great team behind me and uh, great leadership behind me too. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. So, you know, that, that's, you know, and, and I, thank you for giving us the background. And, you know, I, I've had a personal conversation with you and, and we had a, a meeting a few months ago when I asked this question and, and there's a lot of realtors on this call. So I wanted to ask this question to you. Um, what does it take to, to, you know, get through the levels that you've gotten through? Cause you went from being, you know, you can speak to it. You know, I know you were a rentals agent, you were a buyer's agent, you were a listing agent, and then you were this franchise owner with all these offices. Um, what, what does it take to get through those levels and, and, and how do you, you know, what are the steps you took to get to where you are today? Yeah. 
Well, speaking of levels, which is what we'll come out yeah. with here uh, mid-year, um, you know, I look at levels, and when I say levels, I mean every agent has a different place in their journey along the career path of real estate, right? And so when I say levels, I mean, you call it beginner level, you know, zero to five million, where we're at, what you need to do to get from five to 15 million, what you need to do to get from 15 million to 25 to 50 to 100. And over the past decade, I've been on every single level because I started with zero. Now, in my first year in my first year back in real estate, um, you know, I did, I think I did four and a half million bucks, you know, in 2010. So I started really from scratch and I did, I, I was running a lot of rentals. Um, I knew if I did a great job on the rental side, when they turned into a purchase uh, purchaser a year, two years down the road, if, if I stayed in contact with them, they would utilize my services again. And, um, and so I just was hustling and grinding uh, the first, I mean, when I say the first couple of years, it's not, I mean, I, I still hustle and grind now. I mean, harder than ever, but I mean, pounding the pavement. I'm talking about doing rentals for a thousand bucks a month, right? Like I would do anything and everything I could do. And I did it not because of the paycheck. I wanted to be busy, but I wanted to learn. And I knew the more transactions I did, the smarter I would become. And so that's all I did. And in fact, in 2012, I did, I want to say it was 220 personal units and I only did 18 million in volume. So you think about that. Like, I mean, my average price was less than a hundred thousand dollars. You know, I was just grinding and, um, but I learned so much. And then as, as the units and I, I started a lot of self promotion, like, you know, more units sold than, than anyone in the state, right? Like I utilized what I could utilize in terms of credibility to put it out there to the world. And then once I did that, it became one of those things to work. I was starting to build a name for myself. I started to get more referrals from my past clients and things started to steamroll. But I, I, I've, always, I've always tried to measure the levels within the levels. And what I mean by that is when I was in say level two, right? I wouldn't compare myself to somebody that was in level five. And I think that's a big mistake agents make is they think that in their second and third year, they should be doing 50 and 70 and hundred million. And it just doesn't work that way. It's not it's not made to work that way. Real estate, so long as there's no major housing crash, real estate is designed to be an upward trajectory year after year after year. And if you follow your own guidelines to success and follow other people's guidelines to success, then you find yourself in a couple of years getting to that next level. You know, I, I, I don't want anybody to look at like my accomplishments or anything that's been in the business for three years and think next year you're going to be Jason Mitchell because you're not. Um, it just doesn't work that way. And so I never compared it that way. You know, my, in 2012 and 13, I wanted to become the number one agent in the state of Arizona under 40 years old. As I continued to grow my career, I started to get my numbers to a point where I could aspire to say, look, I want to be the number one agent in the state now because I think I can get there. But I never forced that. I never, I never said, now I always wanted to be there, but I also knew that 2011, 12, 13, I didn't have, I, I didn't have the wherewithal to do that. It was going to take me time to get there. And when we say that journey, I think that word is overused a little bit, but I like that word in the sense of it is a journey. Like I looked at, and still to this day, like I want in 2021, I want to do $2 billion in sales in 2021, right? That's our journey. Last year, I wanted to do a half a million or half a billion. We did that. The year before, I wanted to do 300. We did that. Like I look at this journey and say, okay, in order to get to where I need to be, what do I have to build internally to do so to hit this number? But my numbers were always realistic. I never wanted to set unrealistic guidelines for what I wanted to accomplish because of just things that were out of my control. And so I always looked at the level I was in and said, okay, in order to get to the next level, I need to accomplish these things and I think I'll get there. And I was just dedicated to the process. I was relentlessly dedicated to my own outline. Every, every year and every quarter, I come up with a new outline of where I need to be and where now my company needs to be. And I'm dedicated to it. I make sure that I do the things I say that I'm going to do. Even if it doesn't appear to be working, I stay true to that because things take time. And so I've always stayed true. Like, for example, um, we have a technology platform. We call it Camp. 
I would put our technology against any other technology in the country when it comes to our agent CRM systems. It took me three years to build the core concept of what we were doing. And that was two days a week, two days a week, two hours a day, because I knew that I couldn't dedicate weeks and weeks and months and months collectively because I still needed a paycheck. I needed to sell real estate. So what I did is I carved out every Tuesday and every Friday, I would go down to the place that was building it with me and I would dedicate eight o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the morning. I think that's what it was. And I was just dedicated for, for a long time to build the core. And now we have bells and whistles to that core. But my point is a lot of people give up. A lot of people have attrition within their own mindset and you can't have that. Cause I knew that if I, if I built what was in my mind and I could structure it to where we had the proper workflows, distribution, journeys along the way, along the path of buyer, seller, awareness, camaraderie within our team. I knew that if I was going to build what was in my head and was in the roadmap that I could have something that I was on to something and I didn't want to give up and I didn't want to fail. And in the meantime, I'm spending all this money and time building this, not knowing like, Hey God, I hope this works, but I started to see that it works. So I became, I became overly dedicated to, to seeing it through. And that's where a lot of people, in my opinion, fail is that the plan, I mean, Ralph, when I spoke at your event in January, I said, look, 90% of you will leave here today and you will put a plan together. And 90% of you that put the plan together will lose that plan within 30 days because you won't be committed to your own plan. And that's crazy to me because the plan is the plan. Ralph, the plan's like you. Part of your plan every day is that you go to the gym. That's just your personal plan and you don't get off that plan, right? It's the same thing in business, except in real estate, it's even easier because our plan as real estate professionals is more simplistic than almost any industry out there because our plan is consistently repetitive with every transaction. It does not matter if it's a $100,000 home or a $10 million home, that process is almost identical every single time. You, nego you, you show a home, you negotiate, you get in the contract, you do an inspection, you do a walkthrough, you close. Every deal has its nuances, but that process is almost identical every time. And so when you find yourself in duplication, it's about finding your own roadmap to making sure that you have systems and processes in place so that duplication process takes care of itself so you can be on the front end procuring more deals. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And you said a couple of things that um that I wanted to I wanted to touch on. So again, I agree with you completely. And my life is based off consistency. So if I consistently do the same thing every single day, I'm gonna it'll it'll build to something. I'm building a foundation every single day. So I completely agree with you there. But you said you know that and a lot of people look at programs. People in million dollar listing, and I'll mention Ryan Serrano because everybody knows his name. And you know his programs may work for million dollar listings, but they may not work for everything. You've kind of been through the process. You've been to 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, and now you sell million dollar properties. So, and you said everything is the same. Is your process really the same for a hundred thousand dollar property or a million dollar property? Are you selling it the same way? Or, you know, what, what goes through the process? What's the biggest differences you would say between the two? Okay. So the answer to that is yes, the process is the same. The talent is not. And what I mean by that is to sell a million dollar property or to market a million dollar property is different than marketing a $300,000 property. The point is though, is that that process is the same. You still have to get photos and tours. You still have to market. It's just a different demographic of individuals you're marketing to. And it takes a different talent level to sell a million dollar plus property than it does. Now, granted, look, I, the very first, million dollar home I ever sold. I swear to God, this is a true story. I was doing an open house every day and it was like 60 some days in a row. And the neighbor across the street came over and he says, I'm going to list my home and I want you to be the listing agent because I see that you are here every single, it was a vacant flip. I see that you are here every single day, busting your butt to sell this house. And that's the kind of agent I want. And so when I say sometimes you get lucky, I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. I got it. No problem. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I know the community so well and blah, blah, blah. And I went over there. His name was Tom. And I went over there. I met with him in the evening. And he says, I'm going to pay you full listing commissions. Just give me everything you got. And I said, no problem. And I left there. I get in my car. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing here. 
Uh, I never sold a million dollar house in my life. I hope I do the right thing. And I sold it in five days. And that really wasn't anything I did. Now the negotiations may be, but you know, sometimes you get lucky. The yeah. point is though, is that they are different and they're different in the sense of the people you're usually dealing with, meaning the agent themselves are typically, if you're dealing with agents that sell many multiple million dollar homes, they have a different talent level than agents that sell two and three hundred thousand dollar homes, meaning that they've typically been through it before, they understand it's a little bit more of a seasoned agent. And it's also a little bit more of an agent that has to deal with certain criteria within their client pool rather than somebody that two, three, four hundred thousand, they just want to sell, move on, move up buyer. There's a there's different nuances to selling luxury. But I I, I use this term a lot in I'd say pick up your spares and strikes will come. And what I mean by that is I've never considered myself a luxury agent ever. I'm just a guy that sells a lot of real estate. That's all I've ever been. I'll sell a 500,000. I don't care. That's great. I'd sell a $300,000 house. That's great. That's income. And I think that those that market and brand themselves as only luxury find themselves shooting themselves in the foot because there's a lot of business, the majority of business is done on a unit level. People pay attention to this volume play and all these commissions when really real estate is done on a unit level because real estate, the true blueprint of real estate is to close as many deals as possible to obtain as many clients in your portfolio of services than you can possibly imagine. And that goes to the units. Real estate is about units because real estate is about your book of business and the referrals that come from within that book of business. And I found myself in 2013 and 14 selling just a ton of houses, tons of houses, 200s, 400s, 600s, right? And it led me to get referrals from these folks that were higher end clients, which then led me to getting their friends and family, right? It was a steamroll effect of years and years of dedicating myself to my craft and the fact that I just wanna sell a bunch of houses. Everything else comes from there. And those that come out of the gate that brand themselves as luxury, I can tell you this, people do their research. And if you're not a luxury agent and you pretend to be, you're done because it's very easy to find what you sell and when you sell it. The goal is to create enough awareness about yourself so you get the at bat to prove yourself that you'll work harder than any other agent that you're gonna hire to sell that home. And then you get your at bats. Once I got my at-bats and I started selling them, then I started to get more and more luxury. But had it not been for me focusing on just selling a ton of real estate, that opportunity wouldn't have been there. Yeah. And, 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 and there's a lot that you said is powerful in that, um, that you just, and I agree. The, the idea is to do as much business as you possibly can because you're not to turn as many referrals as you possibly can. And you kind of grow, to grow your network is really the, the concept of all this. Um, so you went from being, a, again, a, a rental agent to a, you went through the whole process of being a real estate agent. Then at some point you decided to start a team. And then at some point you started, you decided to start a franchise. So I'm sure you made some mistakes along the way. And I'm sure there were ups and there were downs. Can you talk to a little bit about when you thought you were ready to expand your business to a level where you went from being a team to a broker, to a franchise and, and what that, what that entails, like, what are the steps that you would say it takes to get there um, to do it the right way and not make a million mistakes and have to go back to being an agent? Well, let me clarify. So we don't franchise. Um, we have marketplace leaders in the markets that we serve. Um, everything falls under the JMG umbrella. Um, our goal was that we service a lot of, again, corporations. And so we have multiple states and multiple markets that we set up shop in. We hire the right leadership to make sure that we bring on the right agents that follow our protocols in our way. And by doing so, you'll have an opportunity to grow your business like nowhere else in the country. And that's a fact. But I will say this, there's, if, if people here are listening about building a team and growing a team, I will tell you this. I have seen so many teams fail and they spend so much time in training and development because their retention is not where it needs to be because the things that they say that they will provide and the opportunities that they say they'll provide their agents don't hold true. And at some point, six months, eight months down the road, agents will get 
will start seeing that and understanding it. And then they ask themselves, is it really worth me being here and paying these splits to this team if I'm not getting X, Y, and Z as I was promised? And there's a lot of teams out there that promise a lot of things and they don't deliver. And they find themselves in this perpetual motion of constant recruitment and constant attrition because they haven't actually figured out their own core values of value. And so if you're not ready, don't do it. Because the last thing you want is to spend all time and energy trying to build a team, but yet you don't have your core concepts in place. I mean, teams are different. Teams offer different things, culture, training, support, brand, opportunity to build your business. But if you can't package up a benefits to your agents, they will eventually leave you. So be careful before you go start a team because the number one thing that you can bring to anybody is additional opportunity to grow your business. And that's where I started. When I started to have too many buyers to where I couldn't service them at the level they deserve to be serviced, I brought on my first buyer's agent. And I always told myself, and I stay true to this model to this day, and Ralph, you know this, I could, today, I could bring on hundreds of agents in Arizona if I wanted to. I could bring on hundreds of agents across the country if I wanted to. The problem is, is that if I give them my commitment, that not only will I provide you with great systems support technology, but I'll provide you with additional business, I will fail them because I don't have enough business to support that many agents in all of these marketplaces. I have to be able to live up to my commitments. And so if I say, hey, in LA, we can support two more referral agents, I know I have enough business to support that. But if I said we have enough to support 15, and then all of a sudden, instead of getting eight to 10 referrals a month, you're getting one, you'll eventually leave me. And what that means is that my ops team and my leadership team that have spent time, effort, energy, money, putting these people on board, training them, getting them to buy into our process and our ways, they go out the door, well, that was a waste. And so I stay true to my model from day one, I always have. 2013, I brought on my first buyer's agent, her name was Claire. She's been my number one agent to this day, literally. And so I got very lucky with her. Um, but I had enough business to where I knew I could help her grow her business. And then we brought on another agent because I got more business in the door that I knew I could still fill Claire's bucket and I could fill this new person's bucket and I could still fill my bucket. And then it just steamrolled into, I have enough opportunity to bring on another person and then another person. Now, as I started to grow that, we started to be able to do more transactions, which led to more capital for our team. So then I started marketing more, which then brought in more business, more agents. Then we had to build support around that. So my team was not built overnight. It's taken me eight years to build my team to where we are today. And I still stay true to that model of, look, you know, we're in, take any market, take Dallas, Texas, right? Right now I have enough business in Dallas to probably support five to six agents, but I couldn't have my marketplace leader down there, Steve, say, hey, bring on 20 agents. I'll make sure that, I'll make sure that we do our part. I would fail. And so any person that's considering building a team or taking your team to the next level, make sure that you can stay true to the commitments that you make to your agents because they'll leave you. And rightfully so. I always say to my agents very clearly, if you feel as though that you can bring more to the table on your own than you being at this team, then you have every right to leave me. No questions asked. But we don't lose people because we stay true to what we say we can do and we continue to add value to those agents. And so the secret sauce to any team is make sure that you can hold up to the commitments forward to your agents. Otherwise, you'll never have a great team. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and, you know, we have a huge team here too, and it's the same thing. Um, I just feel you feel responsibility to provide value to them or there's no reason for them to stay because you're almost you're, you're technically business partners you're part of the bargain is you're going to bring business to them and the part of the bargain is they're going to close it so i agree with you there um you know you you've bought and sold a lot of real estate i know there are a lot of people on here that are interested in buying and selling real estate or, or they, they they're interested in this market and what's going to happen um what do you see because you're on the west coast and your market hasn't been affected by this as, as, as much as everybody else has here a lot of people here in the northeast right. 
What do you see going on with the market? And uh, coming out of here, where would you suggest there's opportunity to buy um, in a market in a market like this? Well, I was asked actually by a, a local news station yesterday to do a state of the market on COVID-19. And so anybody that's listening, if you follow at Jason Mitchell Real Estate on Instagram or just follow Jason Mitchell on Facebook, uh, follow me on Facebook, we're going to make a posting today about the state of the market, which we do talk a lot about investing and where we see values going. I will say this, the conventional markets, look, Ralph, you're a finance guy. Real estate follows the money. Where there's money, there's transactions. Where there's no money, there's no transaction. It's a simple formula, okay? Right now, the jumbo market has no investors behind it. So what does that mean? That means it's going to be very difficult to secure jumbo financing, which means it's going to be less buyers out there because products are too tight. However, on the conventional side, there still are plenty of products out there, and there still are plenty of able and willing buyers that want to get a 3.5% 30-year fixed interest rate. And the buyer demand in the markets that we can still do business in during this crisis, our buyer demand has been off the charts. It's pent up buyer demand. We're seeing plenty of it. The luxury market, we're seeing it soften a little bit. And I would argue that you're going to see it soften even more, especially states like New York and California. But the conventional markets will hold strong. So when it comes to investing, you always got to look at where the money's at. And the money is still behind your three, four, five hundred thousand dollar properties. Now, those specific properties, though, depending on the property type, is where I would also look to say, where's the money? And what I mean by that is your single family home that can qualify as single family, your three, four bedroom, two and a half uh, bath property will always have money behind it. But your condos, those could, those could suffer. People could pull from condos saying instead of 10% down, you need 25%. That, li that limits your marketplace. I mean, there's just things that you got to look at to say, okay, where is the biggest buyer pool for me? that I can sell this property. The other thing, I was, on a, um, I was on a podcast with one of my really good friends, Jamil, who is one of the largest owners of wholesale, um, a wholesale company here in the Valley, here in Phoenix. And I told him, I said, the other thing you gotta budget for is your carry. So if you're utilizing hard money, instead of thinking that you can get out in four months total, budget another six or seven just in case. And look at your numbers in reverse by, by saying, look, my carry, you know, if I can sell for 400 and, and, and back out your numbers to where your actual retail or wholesale number needs to make sense, just budget in a little bit extra carry in there um, because it might take a little bit longer. But I do believe that the conventional markets are going to hold up really strong in what we're going through. I truly do. I just think that you need to be very careful on luxury right now. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I think I spoke, spoke about this last week. 90% of the loans that we've done over the last five or six years, seven years, that, that financing is still all available. As a matter of fact, it's gotten more aggressive in some areas. So I think that we're fine there. I agree with you. Um, you know, again, your market, it, Phoenix is open, Jason, right? You're, are, you, are you guys able to kind of show homes at, at this point pretty regularly or how is, how is it being treated by you? Well, we can show homes. Okay. It, look, Phoenix is doing great. And, and the, the majority of our markets are doing great. It's Michigan, New York, New Jersey. You just can't do business. It's yeah. just unfortunate you can't do business. I wish we could, because I think we'd put a ton of deals in the pipeline. Um, Arizona, yes, we can show homes. The issue we're having, I think, is a lot uh, is indicative of a lot of the marketplaces, meaning just like California, just like Washington, just like Texas, just like Georgia, it's the sellers. The sellers are reluctant right now. The sellers are just harder to get into homes, don't want to show homes as frequently, want to be very careful, uh, tighter schedules on showing properties, which leads to buyers saying, well, I just don't want to go look at that house, right? We're seeing plenty of buyers in the marketplace. It's more challenging on the seller. We're also seeing inventory shortages because a lot of sellers aren't listing their home right now because they want to wait for this to be over with, which is actually leading to tightening of inventories, which makes it a little bit more challenging for buyers too. And so it's more on the seller side than it is on the buy side. Everyone thinks that buyers have gone away. They have not gone away at all. It's the sellers that we're having challenges with right now in the marketplace. It's not the buyers. Yeah, yeah. I, I, put, I put that out there last week too. You know, before 2008, and everybody likes to look at 2008, and this is not that. That was a real estate crisis. We had um, 
basically 2 million in excess homes that were built at that point. We had a huge surplus. Now we had the largest shortage that we've ever had, essentially, as of this February. So there's a big difference in the market. So I agree with you there. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions in a few minutes, guys, but I wanted to ask Jason a couple more questions before I do that. Um, so hey, I'm comment on that real quick. Anybody, anybody, I don't care who, I don't care who they are. Anybody that's telling you this is 2008 all over again is so wrong that they, I, I don't even, I don't even know how I could, and I've heard it from multiple people. I don't know what these people are talking about. Real estate, like anything. Look, if I have five of something, what is that worth? If I have one of something, what is that worth? If people want it, it's a supply and demand game. That's real estate. And by the way, also our economy right now, given where we're at, has obviously changed over the past six weeks, but we'll get back to a state of normalcy at some point, right? That demand will be there, but we're still going to be short inventory. And by the way, with what's happening with builders, they're going to get tightened up too because of their, I mean, because of the commodities, because of everything that's hard to get to, they can't build as many homes. And they were also, they, they needed to build more homes than they were currently building as it is. And now they're going to be slowed down on that. Like inventory is going to be an issue for a while. And so if inventory is an issue, then we don't have, the demand will be there enough because of interest rates and people that are still going to be employed but the inventories will be short. You hit the nail on the head. The reason we had a problem in 2008 is because we had an abundance of homes. There wasn't enough buyers and there were buyers that wow. couldn't qualify because financing, there was no financing. Like there's still financing right now. There was no financing. I don't care. I don't care what you were trying to buy. You were not getting a loan. This is not 2008. In fact, I will, I will bet you that you will still see appreciation in the conventional real estate markets at the end of 2020. I guarantee it in the majority of U.S. cities, if not close to all of them. It's the luxury that will suffer because just like I said, there's no financing behind it right now. But conventional markets, plenty of demand and lack of inventory. And by the way, I don't know if you've noticed wherever you're in the country, would you rather rent a home right now? given where rental values are, are you kidding me? Rentals are off the chart expensive right now. Do you wanna rent or do you want a three and a half year fixed 30 year? Like it just doesn't make sense and there's not enough inventory. So this is not 2008, it's not even close. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And guys, the reason I, I asked that question and I felt it was, just, it was important is Jason's in so many markets, he can kind of tell you what's going on in other places. So it's not just, this is gonna be a national thing. It, it, we, we had a shortage and just for the record, there's a shortage of affordable housing rentals in the country. It, it is a complete shortage of that. So he's right, rents are through the roof right now. And that's because all they've been building is luxury rental buildings. There's an overage in luxury rental buildings. So just another reason to stay away from the rental market. That's a whole different conversation. Um, Jason, you know, I'd like to talk, just, I have another question for you and I'm a big routine person and I kind of live my life in routines and I have my schedule from, 4.30 a.m. every day till about 9 to 10 a.m. is the same every single day, no matter what. Um, but I kind of would like to know what your routine is in real estate. And I know you, you, you're used to being on a plane a lot, but you haven't been in the last couple of months. But um, what's your routine in real estate on a daily basis? Well, for me, it's just constant re reprioritization. You know, my day, you know, I usually start getting on the phone around 7 o'clock. I get into the office around 8, 8.30-ish. And then after work, after I leave the office, I'm usually on the phone till another, but probably seven o'clock at night, eight o'clock at night. I, I'm constantly communicating with partners. My job is very simple. Bring in more partners and maintain and do an excellent job with the current partners that we have so we can continue our relationships with them. And so typically, my typical routine is I'm traveling throughout the country, meeting with our partners, consulting with our partners, helping them go through their workflows, their mapping, seeing what their visions are, and trying to execute around what their plan is, regardless of the partnership. And it's also meeting with our market leaders to make sure that we're always on the same page and doing what we do. Um, and it's a great life. It really is. It's a lot of travel, but it, it's, uh, it's something I haven't been able to do for the past two months. <laughs> but what's been great, but what's been great is by me being in the office now every day for the past two months, when I'm usually here 30% of the time, is I got to hunker down with our ops team. And our visions and our plans of what we've been building the past two months have been the best two months of inner productivity that we've ever had. 
And it's been great to be able to put new processes, new systems, tighten up our systems because I'm here every day. And I trust that it gets done when I'm not here, but it's just like anything else. Like when the boss is there, things just happen to get done a little bit, uh, a little bit quicker, right? Um, but it is, you know, I get in the office, I look at priorities, I look at different tasks and projects from the different departments and what they need to do and reshuffle if necessary. We go on tasks and projects. Projects are long-term, tasks are daily. Like, I look at their daily tasks, what they're up to, just to put my eyes on it. I look at projects to see if we need to reshuffle. Like, for example, we get a new partnership, which we typically get a couple new partnerships every month. We look to say, okay, what do we got to do to build around this partnership? And then we pause what we're doing to build around that, get it out the door, get the campaigns going, and go back to what we were doing. And so we're constantly just reprioritizing our projects and tasks to make sure that what is important gets done first. And, um, and so to me, it's just accountability, accountability within my leadership team, making sure that our out of market, so I'm, I'm here in Scottsdale, but making sure that we're constantly sending messages to our leadership team about what we're up to, what's coming up, um, keeping uh, engagement within our agents. Um, but, the, but the day routine is get up, make some calls, get to the office. You know, I'm here till like five-ish, 5.30-ish, get home, have another couple hours of work to do at home, and then I just do it all over again. And yes, I do it on the weekends too. It's just, for me, it's just part of the deal. Um, but a lot, a lot of phone calls, a lot. I mean, I'm on the phone constantly and it's good. I need to be present within our relationships. I need to be present within our partnerships. Um, so yeah, I'm on the phone a lot. Okay. All right, guys, I'm gonna, we have a couple of some questions on Facebook already, so I'm gonna start opening it up to questions and you can just drop your question in the chat and, and um, I'll read it off to Jason. But Jason, the first question I got was, what are the top three things you could offer a buyer's agent to recruit them and keep them? So, so top three things that you would, well, obviously your offer is different than somebody else's offer, but if you would just, you know, what, what would you, what would you get, what would your value props be to, to recruit a buyer's agent in? Well, it depends like on what level. And so if you're at a level one or level two, it's hard to really pitch that whole, I'm going to give you all my experience and training and all because you're not quite like a lot of people can get away with experience expertise. If they've made a way for themselves and they're at, you know, level three or level four, some people may join you just to pick your brain and be around that, but they'll, they'll eventually leave that wears, that wears thin. Um, the number one thing is opportunity, right? And I think a lot of agents hold on to every single deal that they can thinking that they have to close every deal that they get. And that's not true because you're actually doing a disservice to your clients because you, as you're making your way through your levels, at some point you can't manage the amount of pipeline that you do. But what happens is a lot of agents want to hold that pipeline and they don't want to share that pipeline. It's like children. They don't want to share their toys. Agents don't want to share their clients. When in reality, if you share some of your clients, you actually get to improve the lives of a buyer broker who you're also capitalizing on their self-gen business too, but also building their business. And as you see that, hey, because I didn't have to spend six, seven hours showing two tours to these people, I let somebody else do it, I was able to free up my time here to try to bring more business in the door. That's the alternative play to being able to let go of your pipeline a little bit. And that's how you build a great team. You understand that your value prop is based around bringing an opportunity to the door to let others facilitate while you maintain the book of business and or the client pipeline that you want, but not try to have it all. Because when you get greedy with your pipeline, you're not able to build a team because you have to give them some of your pipeline. But it's Number one, it's better for the client. And number two, it's better for you because that person appreciates that $200,000 transaction and they will work it and they will do a better job than you, but you still get to earn money off of that referral that you've given to one of your agents. And that's the key to building this. Like the key is let's bring in as much business as possible so we can distribute this business along the way and we can capitalize on that business while we work on bringing in more. So to me, the number one team is a number one thing that somebody can bring a buyer's agent is additional opportunity. And if you're an entrepreneur 
The only thing you should be focused on is how much more business can I bring in the door? Okay. Next question is, what's your advice for foreign bars that are holding off investment opportunities in USA? Any of our banks that are friendly towards mortgage for them? Um, I guess I can answer that. Uh, on the mortgage side, and Jason, I'll, I'll, I'll post the other thing. Um, you know, the foreign national loans are, aren't really um, available at the moment. You know, most of those banks stopped funding when all this started uh, completely. So they're looking for income documentation again. Uh, we have seen them start to come back little by little, um, but at very, very low uh, loan to values, like 50 or 60%. So there are some programs out there right now, but not very many. And if they are, they're going to have to put a lot of money down. Um, so that's my advice right now is they're going to have to take a wait and see out because there's not much you can really tell them. I don't know, Jay, I don't know if you have anything else to say. Well, I, I would say that just goes to look at the market. Like if you're an investor, then look at marketplaces that are seasonal areas. What I mean by that is like, I'm from Detroit, right? Well, seasonal areas to, up to, to Michiganders are places like Traverse City, places that are like second home areas. And so in, in, in Scottsdale, we have a city called Fountain Hills, tons of second homeowners, uh, communities. Look around the area, the demographic that you're in, and think about those places where you find a lot of second homeowners that come in and visit. And those are places that you would probably want to stay away from because they're so heavily influenced by second and third homeowners that are either out of state or out of country. And so be cognizant of that because if the money isn't following Canadian nationals or whoever it may be, um, those areas will be affected. Um, so just think about that. I got a question from Facebook. Um, and I know you have your own CRM, but what programs do you use to help automate your process besides agentology? I don't know if you use agentology, but. What, what programs would you say? What programs do you recommend to automate? Well, um, you know, we have our own internal programs that we do for automation. Um, we call it Camp. It's based off Infusionsoft platform. Um, it just depends. I mean, like, let let me comment on this. What what program? There's a Sync is a great system, right? Boomtown is a great system. Where the problem comes into play is that people that spend that upfront marketing dollars to get top of funnel referrals in and then utilize those top of funnel referrals to say, Oh, I'm giving my team leads. Let me tell you this, your agents really don't want to work those leads. And even though they will at some point, they will get what I call lead exhaustion because agents want to be in the field and you don't want to call a hundred people to get one buyer. And there's a lot of agents that do that and they may find themselves with success, but my God, is that an exhausting, exhausting career. And so I would say this, there's a lot of great CRM systems and automation systems, but I'm speaking to the team leaders right now and even the agents out there too, to spend the money for upfront top of funnel referrals. There are so many places that are, this is an interesting statistic. There will be five and a half to six million homes sold this year in the country. There will be 105 million leads. <laughs> That's crazy. Think about that. That's Think about that. One out of 20 will close. So the goal would be to find the channel accounts, find the, find the ways that you can get better quality and or have somebody scrub that quality to give to your agents before you're just handing off somebody that filled out a form named Mickey Mouse, right? Like, let's be smart about our distribution and our quality, because that's the one thing I've learned in this whole thing. Quality is everything. If you exchange good quality stuff to your agent pool, they will stay loyal to you, because every time you give them a lead, they have an opportunity to close it. But garbage in, garbage out. And eventually, if you're handing out garbage, you're either gonna have really bad teammates, or you're gonna have agents that eventually leave you because they know they can do it themselves. Um, next question I have is, how do you recommend a newer agent approach obtaining new leads in New Jersey with the concerns, fears, buyers, sellers around COVID? Empathy. Yeah. Empathy. The pitch right now is not about, let's get you out and look at a house. The pitch right now is, listen, I'm calling you, first of all, to see how your family is doing. And they're gonna say, wow, that's a great agent. How is your family doing? You guys staying safe? Great. Listen, I want to let you know I'm going to be here when the time is right. But my first and foremost objective, if you're going to be a new client of mine, is to make sure that you and your family are safe 
and to make sure that you understand that you're going to work with an agent that actually cares about you. And so when the time is right, we will get out there and we will find that right home. But the time just may not be now. And I would hang up that phone and I would say, wow, that's my agent. Because of what we're going through, the message is different. And so long as you incubate that client and stay in front of them with empathy, when that time is right, they are going to buy from you. But the pitch right now is not, hey, I see that you're looking for a $400,000 home in Middleton. Um, when do you want to go take a look? I, I, I got a bunch of properties in mind. Like, this is not a sale right now. The sale is empathy. The empathy, the empathy will lead to the sale. So keep that in mind. If you're in Michigan, New York, New Jersey, your sale right now is your empathy. And that will lead to a future actual sale. That's good. That's good. I really like that answer. Um, I, have an answer I have a question over here. How did you know um, when it was, uh, so basically the question is, how, would you, how did you know when it was time to keep going up a level as far as what you were selling and, and the market you were focused on? And like, what was the, and, and obviously I, I'm, I'm going to interpret, it's easy for you to look back now and say, um, oh, at, when I was at $500,000 listing, I knew I can go to a million because of X, Y, and Z. But what, how do you know when it's time to you expand your market is probably the question, what the question really is. How, how, would you, how did you know when it was time for you to expand your market to start focusing on a broader, because I think sometimes people start, it's too broad and they're too all over the place and, and, and nothing gets done then. So how did you know you had something going that we were trying to focus on something else? I knew, it's so funny. It, we didn't really start building this team outside of Phoenix until the end of 2000, until 2017. So it's only been three years. Um, and the reason I did that, I waited, is I remember my VP of sales, his name's Leon, he came to me and said, we need to recruit we can bring on more agents. We should bring on more agents. And I responded to him for two years in a row. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. And I knew I wasn't ready because I knew that I didn't have my centralized distribution set up to where every agent works on the same platform and same system, no matter where they are in the country. And I knew I had to create that, that centralized platform, because even take what we have right now. I mean, we don't, Outside of Phoenix, we have like a small office in Tucson and we got a little office in Jersey, a little office in Michigan, but like I'm talking really small offices. We're able to do what we do virtually. Um, and I wanted to make sure that if I expanded into California, if I expanded into Texas, if I expanded into New York, that our systems and processes were the exact same systems and processes that we ran in Phoenix because I knew my ops team, if they did, it's like McDonald's, right? If I go to McDonald's in Brooklyn, New York, or if I go to McDonald's in Seattle, Washington, I'm going to get the exact same sandwich. And the people that make that sandwich have the same instructions behind them in both places. My team knows how to make the sandwiches because they make the sandwiches in every single state the same way. It's the same transaction. It's the same checklist. And so when I knew that I had the right flows built out, to where everything was systemized under one central platform, to where we did everything the exact same way, no matter where, where you are as an agent, I knew then I had it, but I hadn't had it built yet. And once I knew I had it built, I tested it. I opened Tucson and it worked. Then I opened San Diego and it worked. Then I opened LA and it worked. And I'm very grateful because a lot of my partners trusted me and they allowed me to open in these markets and said, look, if you open in these markets, we'll back you, right? But my systems and processes were identical. So I never have, even today, like right now, we have $197 million in our pipeline. And I don't stress about it at all because we have the exact same systems. Like it's identical of what we're doing. Right. And so I don't stress about it because I know that these guys know what they need to do. And I know what our agents need to do, because whether you're an agent or you're on our ops team, you we we built it. You, there's no wondering what's going on. It's all in front of you and it all funnels around the exact same process. And so I would say before you go to market expansion, just make sure that you have your systems down to where everybody can be on the same page of what everybody is doing. Because if you're working in chaos and say that 
South Jersey works different than North Jersey, then works different than New York, well, then you're going to be all over the map and there's going to be no consistency. And if there's no consistency, there's no flow, which means that you can't scale or at some point that breaks. That's our secret sauce is the fact that I can open anywhere and I know it won't break because the system has been built. Uh, Jason, I had a question from somebody that asked what market you're in. Okay, so we have uh, states we're in, New York, New Jersey, Florida, Georgia, Texas, Michigan, Minnesota, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, California, Washington, and coming soon is uh, uh, North Carolina. And, and we, are, we are in Illinois, we just haven't grew the team in Illinois yet. And if you know anybody in North Carolina that'd be a great leader, we'd love to talk to them. That's our next, that's our next marketplace. And if I mentioned Florida, I hope I mentioned Florida. We're all throughout Florida too. But keep this in mind, on all these marketplaces, we don't have a ton of agents. We want agents that, wanted, that want to truly grow their business. To put a number out there, our agents last year did four and a half to one team generated deals to self generated deals. When I commit that I will bring in the opportunities for you so long as you can close them and so long as you follow our protocols, which are taking care of our partners that take care of us and understanding that you better be updating and you, and you better follow our, our ways and you can close, we'll add more business to your book of business than anywhere else. And that's just a fact. But I keep it small. You know, I only have three agents in Orlando. I have six in South Florida. I have two in Tampa right? Because we want to make sure that their buckets are already filled. Now, can I add more in these markets? Yes, but to a limited, to a limited number of agents. And so we just keep this philosophy that if you're an agent on our team, you're going to have more opportunity than anywhere else in the country. And I, and I, I stay true to that model. Jason, I just got a question. Uh, what were some of your best practices used in acquiring and solidifying your referral partnerships? Well, I mean, starting out years ago, it was no matter when you need me, I will be there. I, I, I mean, and what I mean by that is I just want to be a great partner. Give me an opportunity. Let me show you I can close. But if there's anything you need, anything you need, I'm here for you. And I mean, that's why I say I talk to my partners every single day and people think I'm full of crap when I say that. I'm not. Not. I talk to my partners every single day, every day. And that's my job. That's become my job. But now I get to show off a little bit because I have a really great resume of some powerful organizations that trust us. And with that trust becomes responsibility to them to let them know that, look, every day we come to work, we're just trying to get better for you and your clients. But now we built technology around it. And it's unbelievable from ingestion to distribution to awareness to client experience, follow up to, to everything that we've put in place. We have put this in place so I can go to any new partnership and say, look, this is how we do business. And we do it at a higher level than anybody. But in addition to that, my agents are so bought in to our mindset and our philosophies that when we ask them to do certain things, we don't get pushback. So if there's a preferred title company you want us to use, consider it done. If there's a preferred lender you want us to use, consider it done. If you want to have a monthly coaching call, consider it done. Like whatever we can do to be a great partner, that's all we want to be. Now we get to show off a little bit though, because we built an entire company around this B2B concept. I mean, 90% of our business is from referral partners and we'll do 3000 transactions this year. That's amazing. Um, hey, okay, here we go. Here's from somebody else. Do you feel that, that due to COVID, suburbs and more rural areas, maybe 45 minutes to an hour outside of the city, will see an increase in demand? Thanks, and again. So basically, he's, he's asking if people are more moving out away from metropolitan areas, more to suburbs, which I think is, I think yes, but I'm going to let you answer. I don't know. I mean, here's the deal. I live in Phoenix, which is, I think it's the fourth or fifth largest city in the country. I think it's right behind Houston, number five. But it's not New York, and it's not Seattle, and it's not downtown Detroit. Like, it's just different. Now, downtown Phoenix is downtown, but a lot of people, majority of people don't live downtown Phoenix. And so I'm desensitized to that in a sense because Phoenix in itself is really all suburbs. You've been here, Ralph. I mean, it's, it's all suburbia, right, for the most part. And um, 
So I don't see a lot of people leaving the suburbs to go rural. No, I don't see that at all. But would they leave the big, would they leave downtown Chicago to go live in Naperville or Hinsdale? Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know, Ralph, what do you think? I mean, so what I, what I, I've seen stats that, um, that people are, were moving away from metropolitan areas in general in cities because it was just a trend that had been happening since 2012 anyway. So I think it's something that was happening. And like I said before, I think the majority of the rentals that have been built have been these luxury buildings. Right now, being in New York, New Jersey, people are not that comfortable being in their buildings anymore. So I think that because of that, depending on the market you are, you may see a big push more out to space. And the other thing is, is that now people have gotten used to working from home. People who weren't working virtually, a lot of people have gotten used to working virtually. Then why do I need to pay expense? You know, reason people oh. in metropolitan areas is because of lifestyle. But now, That's now right. if you don't need that lifestyle or your lifestyle is changing, I think there's a shift. But I, I do think there's a shift. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And that that's why I think New Jersey is poised to do extremely well when this thing is over with. I really do. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was enough issues going on in New York as it was, and now you got this. I mean, look, how many business owners and how many independent contractors that felt like they had to be in a city that are now sitting there saying, why am I going to spend five grand a month? Why am I a business owner spending 30 grand a month? We can do this from home. Is it perfect? No. But if I can save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, millions of dollars a year, yeah, I think we can make this work. I mean, look, when you even think about it, if there's accountability within your meetings, and, and what I mean by that is one of my best friends is one of the one of the top leadership levels at Quicken Loans, and we were talking, he's one of my best friends, so we talk a lot, but we were talking the other day, and he said, you know, I have accountability. I get to see their face, you know, and then another partner of mine, Jake at Veterans United, was saying, look, we're purposely making them go on Zoom calls so we can make sure, like, they're not drinking, they're not hungover, and all this other stuff. My point of saying this is you can have accountability with face-to-face and not be in an office now. Yeah. And so that changes complexities, right? Like, I mean, it, this COVID is going to change the way business is done from a brick and mortar perspective. And it's going to really open up commercial space for rezoning opportunities for residential because look, the commercial space is going to absolutely take a hit. There is just no doubt about it. There I agree with you completely. I think that was happening in major cities already. Like that was a big strategy in San Francisco already because they had run out of residential property. So they were changing commercial space into residential. So I think you're right because now commercial properties are going to be cheaper. It's going to take a hit. So now it's going to be rezoned to residential. I completely agree with you there. Um, guys, I just want to do a couple of, if you have any more questions, drop them in. I don't see another one right now, but um, just a couple of little housekeeping things. So Jason and I, uh, you know, part of the reason I wanted to have Jason on is we're really working on something special that we're going to be putting out in the next couple of months. And we're going to pull everybody in to log into this call on it first, um, where Jason's going to be releasing uh, you know, a series, uh, really, and Jason, you can talk a little bit to what, what your concept is around the series you're releasing. Yeah, so um, going back to levels, I wanted to bring something to the real estate industry that everybody could listen and enjoy and then aspire to. And so levels is going to be a series of five different levels. Zero, 100 million plus, and then building a team around segment phases that you can do to get from level one to level two, from level two to level three, from level three to level four. What are the most important factors that you can be doing in order to get to that next level? And so we wanna inspire agents across the country to get to that next level. And so through educational seminars, training videos, um, and then creating our, our mastermind pages around the levels, um, and continuous coaching calls every month per level, new segments every quarter per level. We're going to come out with these level series that will give you the tips and tricks and insight and education and things that you should be doing to level up. Um, Ralph and I will also be filming um, a season in New York here coming up next month um, that's going to just bring a ton of value and content. That's more of an overall basis of content around our industry from mortgage to real estate. But the level series is going to be, you know, the goal is to create the best opportunity from a new agent to the most talented agent, to the most successful agent, to give them the pathway to success throughout our careers and our journeys in this real estate world. And the cool thing is, unlike a lot of other coaches out there, guys, I've done this. 
I mean, it's taken me 10 years, but you know, my best year, I did 152 million, 100, I forgot what it was, 150 some million in personal sales, me personally. And then I did zero and I built one of the largest teams in the country. And so, and I, I'm not a braggadocious guy. I promise you, if you don't know me, I'm not that way. And I don't mean it like that. What I'm saying though, is that I've been through the gutter, I've been through the grind, and I know what it takes to build it. And I know what it takes to get there. And so we're gonna come out with these series that is really gonna help educate our agents on how to get to level after level after level after level. Um, I can't wait for it, Ralph. It's gonna be great. That's awesome. I'm excited. And again, and I think you're the perfect person for it because I know you and you were given no handouts. You know, you grew up in Detroit. You didn't grow up in Phoenix. You, you know, you, you moved out there and kind of built a career for yourself. So I think that you're the person, and I, that resonates with me. You know, more than anything, you're the person to speak to that. And somebody just came up with another question, Jason. Um, everybody, she said, hey, Jason, everyone keeps saying to stop going for original goals for the year. I refuse to. Am I setting myself up for failure? So people set these goals. and You kind of talk about goals. And now we've had two months of nothing. So should your goals be changing or should they be adjusting? Or what do you think? No, I, I've seen that. Time to sit down and recalculate. Time to, you know, I, let me know who all the coaches are out there online or whatever the case is. Like, why? I, I mean, I, I just, I sit back there and I say, no, because all that means now is we got to work harder. Like, the goal's the goal. Like, that means for the next, you know, from June till December, just work your ass off. Just work harder. Like, there's just nothing, there's nothing that frustrates me more than failure. God, I hate, I hate failure. Like, I, I hate putting something out there knowing that I didn't do that. And if you put it out there, regardless of the last six, seven weeks of what's going on, that's just a setback. Like, that's just a setback. Your goal should be the goals. Now we got to look at, look, first of all, there should be a yearly target, yes, but goals should be measured quarter by quarter, by the way, too. And so your quarter two is not going to be as strong as your quarter one, but your quarter three better blow that away because the market will be there to blow it away. I'm telling you, there's, I'm seeing it. If anybody in the country that can talk to it, it's me. I'm in all these markets. There is plenty of buyer demand, right? You can hit your goals this year. You wait and see how this thing slingshots. The minute we're able to go show property, the minute we're able to get out there, the minute we're able to actually transact in real estate, it's game over. Hell, the states that even what we're going through right now, where we can transact, we're having record months. This is our number one, April has been our number one escrow month in California and in Arizona. California is like, I mean, it's California. We can still show houses, but we're really limited to everything else. But people are in the market buying. Like, you guys are still going to have a great opportunity this year to hit your goals. Don't give up on your goals. And, and, yes, and that's really what I wanted you to have, have you on, one of the biggest parts. And I wanted you to tell everybody that you're, what you're seeing and you're still seeing it as a positive market because you've, you've given me the info and it's made me feel better about it. So I wanted you to tell everybody else. And I know the way you tell people, they believe it. Guys, I just, uh, one other thing, I just dropped in next week's meeting into, into the chat. Um, we're going to be having on Paul Getter, who does all of the social media marketing for Grant Cardone and Ty Lopez. And he has, does a lot of stuff around real estate for marketing. So we're having an event next, next week, same time. The event right there about how to take your brand to the next level. And I just wanted to announce that. Secondly, as far as Jason goes, um, you know, look for a release of that series in probably June, late June. Um, and, you know, we're going to put, put it out to everybody. There'll be special discounts to everybody that joined the school. And I didn't tell everybody that before, but there will be a special discount that goes out to everybody that was on the school. Um, does anybody have any other questions before I wrap up? All right, guys. Well, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you were awesome as usual. Thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming in. And I uh, hope to see everybody again soon. Stay safe out there. Thank you, guys, very Thanks, much. Guys. Thank you very much. We appreciate everything. Thank you.